Foraging is more than a hobby. It's a means of sustenance, and for some of us, it really is a way of life. Pretty much everyone has an idea that some wild plants are edible, whether they work in a city high rise or hoe weeds on the farm. And even in this strange modern age, many of us still have childhood memories of finding a cache of wild strawberries, chewing on sour grapevine tendrils, or getting scratched up while picking blueberries and blackberries. But when you become an adult, life becomes complicated. We learn about liability and risk. We try not to trespass on land that's not ours. We hear about ecology and threatened species, and some of us eat out for every meal because we found ourselves living a hectic, stress-filled life. We end up so very distant from understanding the plants that surround us. And suddenly, if your young child grabs your hands and tugs you towards, towards a loaded berry bush, you might find yourself pulling them back, muttering, well, what if it's poisonous? Or leave it alone, we'll, we'll get food later. If those words catch in your throat, or if you were that kid, this video is for you. The truth is there's abundant wild food out there that's nutritious and free and absolutely delicious. I know many of us haven't grown up with parents or a community that foraged regularly and taught us the ropes. Many of us might not be sure where to look or how to get started or even how to know which plants are safe in the first place. But after watching this video, I hope to set your feet on a good path towards understanding and the beginning of your own foraging journey. Now when it comes to beginning foraging, the first matter of business is proper plant identification. Though the number of people who have poisoned themselves with wild plants is minuscule compared to the generations of people and cultures who have eaten and thrived on these plants, there are poisonous plants out there, and it's the job of any forager to know to how to identify them and, of course, not eat them. There is inherent risk with any activity, of course, but the specter of poison has created two very extreme and erring sides of the beginning forager's spectrum. On one half are the terrified. These are the folks still suspicious that every plant is so potentially poisonous that they can make themselves feel literally sick, even if the food was safe and correctly identified. As anyone who has struggled with anxiety knows, it makes you feel nauseated and panicked, and those symptoms are very easy to assign to an imagined poisoning. Worry saps the flavor out of any meal and keeps you from progressing in knowledge. However, I suppose the irony on this side of the spectrum is that these people probably never get poisoned. They can't, because they're too worried that that clump of wild strawberries might, just might, be a deadly nightshade bush in disguise. Spoiler alert, it's not. But on the other side of the spectrum are the throw caution to the wind folks or unsupervised children. Armed with anecdotes, vague information, and bragging overconfidence, they'll eat a plant, even if their identification is lacking. When others are watching and you want to show off your wilderness prowess, it's very easy to declare yourself an expert because you read a book or an article once and you know just a few more facts than your audience does. I would exercise caution around anyone who declares themselves an expert, by the way. These people are the ones who may tragically poison both themselves and the reputation of foraging, adding fuel to the fire of our Western culture's complete disconnect and overblown fear of the natural world. So your job is to be in the thoughtful, well-informed middle. To neither make the assumption that every plant could hurt you, nor the assumption that no plant could hurt you. And that starts with knowing a thing or two, or 20, about the plants that you hope to eat. So let's talk about how to get started. In order to forage, you need to be willing to learn a lot about plants. Not just their names, but their parts, their growing seasons, their preferred habitats, and any idiosyncrasies. Taking the time to really learn your foraged food will allow you to follow the single most important rule in foraging. Never eat a plant unless you are 100% positive of its identity. Samuel Thayer has written a five-step process for plant identification that's just so spot on I couldn't improve it. So here's a summary of the process I've learned from his books and that I use myself in the field. Number one, tentative identification. This is when you find a plant and you think you know what it is. This is the beginning of an identification process, however, not the only part of it. Number two, reference comparison. Now take some time to inspect your potentially identified plant. Compare it to the guidebook that introduced it to you in the first place and read through the description carefully. Make sure that every point listed matches, particularly the ones that are emphasized as key features. If it doesn't match, don't force it to match. And if you don't understand all the botanical lingo, don't just gloss over it. If you lazily TLDR a plant description because the terms are unfamiliar, you put yourself in unnecessary danger. Learn what an umbel, a bract, a petiole, and a racemar, are, and so on, because these are crucial tools for positive identification. And finally, never use a single feature as the only identification confirmation. 
Number three, cross-referencing. Now run through step two with at least two other foraging resources or field guides. Read carefully about potential lookalikes. Make sure you have triple confirmation on the plant's identity. Number four, specimen search. Now go find lots and lots and lots of samples of your potentially identified plant in the field. As you know, or as you'll learn, the environment can totally change how a plant grows. A dandelion growing directly in a sunny field, for instance, will produce feathery, deeply lobed leaves that'll lay almost flat on the ground. A dandelion growing in a shaded area will grow wide leaves that point upwards. You need to learn the range of variability for your target plant so that you can develop your recognition beyond the single photo in a guidebook. This process may take an hour, or it might take years. And step number five, contradictory confidence. This is the deep-seated confidence that means you can recognize and positively identify a plant as food, even if someone were trying to convince you otherwise. That's how well you should know a plant before you eat it. If there is a shred of doubt about a plant you've found, use it as a red flag that it's not time to eat it yet. This is perhaps the most difficult level of identification to achieve, but it's the most crucial. With some plants, it might take years to grasp. Take that time. I still have many plants that are stuck at this step. Though I can find them, I don't have complete confidence if someone were to challenge me on it, and so I still haven't eaten them. Now here's some new forager tips. Don't overindulge. As anyone who has gorged an ice cream knows, the nausea that accompanies an overindulgence is not pleasant. But no one would say you've been poisoned by ice cream. Wild foods also need to be eaten in rational amounts, even if you've found enough to feed an army. Err on the side of caution, particularly with a new one. Eat a small amount and see how you respond to it. Listen to your body. You should listen closely to the physiological cues your body gives when you've ingested a small sample of a new plant for the first time. If you've done your homework, cross-referenced, and identified it correctly, you'll be fine and nothing will happen except the satisfaction of finding a new food. But on the off chance that you start salivating uncontrollably, feel a burning sensation in your throat, find it unpalatably bitter, feel nauseated, or just can't stomach the flavor, spit it out. Your body is telling you that something's wrong. Maybe the plant was misidentified. Maybe it's the wrong time of year to eat it. Maybe you're allergic or something else is going on. Obviously, don't eat any more of the plant. Instead, take several photos or a sample to research why your body reacted and make sure you learn from your experience. If misidentification is the culprit, naturalists at local departments of conservation can often offer positive identification of local plants. Right plant, right time, right way. Wild plants are much like any other domesticated plant. They taste best and are most useful when the right plant is used in the right way at the right point in its growth. Think about the difference between eating a perfect avocado, which is the best, and an avocado that is a week too old, which is the worst. Or consider the potato, not so great raw, but amazing when cooked. Wild plants likewise have windows of prime palatability and safety. Since we in the West don't have a huge cultural tradition of using wild plants, you'll have to go on a personal quest to meet and know every wild plant that you add into your foraging repertoire. Read carefully about when it's best to harvest a wild plant during the growing year and how it's best to prepare for it. Now let's talk about where to find this wild food. The easiest and most accessible place to find wild food is on your own property, and you don't need to even have a back 40 to have enough land. Even a postage stamp in the city can grow a surprising array of food to forage if you know what to look for. Of course, if you find wild plants that you particularly enjoy, there's no reason you can't plant them on your property and maintain your own patches of undomesticated goodness. You can obtain seedlings and bare root trees of many edible native plants from your state's Department of Conservation. Other people's land. This is an option for the bold and polite only. While driving through the city or country, you may find a field or area totally loaded with promising looking food that no one seems interested in. A stand of wild asparagus, a thicket of wild plum, a pecan tree literally dripping with nuts, a pond nodding with cattail. Be proactive and thoughtful and ask the landowner if they would allow you to gather wild food on their land. Accept their answer no matter what it is, with no contest. And if they do agree, be sure to offer some of the haul with them. They'll appreciate the gesture, even if they think you're a bit nuts. If you don't do damage and are respectful, you'll likely be able to make a repeat visit the next season, or even make a friend. But never forage on someone else's land without asking. Now let's talk about other land like parks and nature preserves and things like that. Because this is a dodging and confusing subject as the rules and laws governing foraging are anything but clear or consistent. At the city, state, and national level, you'll find everything from full-scale prohibition to vague allowance. 
You'll find outdated laws that ban Native people from gathering foods in their traditional gathering places, and you'll find park visitors fined for gathering berries, but you'll also find nature programs that teach and encourage foraging, as well as activist groups fighting for people's rights to enjoy wild food as a means of conservation. Online debates rage, some accusing any forager of destroying shared natural spaces, while others explain that foraging actually can improve the land when done responsibly. Every national park, nature preserve, city park, and state forest has its own rules. Some allow foraging, others have restrictions in place limiting how and how much you can gather. Some ban it entirely. So what's an interested forager to do? Well, here's a couple of options. First, you could start by looking for a foraging program offered at a nature center or a park. Not only are these excellent opportunities for first-hand instruction, they also give you an opportunity to locate some areas deemed acceptable for foraging. You could also call ahead to the leadership at a park or forest that you're interested in exploring and see if they allow foraging. It's likely you'll get some disappointing responses, but call anyway. Find out what edible invasive plant is common in these natural areas. Good candidates include garlic mustard, autumn olive, kudzu, and field garlic. Ask if you could help with conservation by foraging for and removing these plants to help support the recovery of native plants, and also make sure you know about the, enough about these plants to back up your claims. Sometimes they even have volunteer task forces specifically aimed at the goal of eradicating invasives. This can help you reinforce the positive good that foraging can do, and it may even provide you an endless supply of those plants. You could also scope out fruit and nut trees in public spaces ahead of time and watch for when they're ready to harvest. In many more urban areas, these trees are seen as a messy nuisance. Ask someone who works in a building on the property if you can help yourself to the unwanted bounty of mulberries, walnuts, persimmons, acorns, or apples. Many people are more than willing to have their sidewalk staining problem cleaned up. Wherever you decide to forage, and whether you get involved in petitioning local authorities for more freedom, or work out a deal with a local park, do it neatly, responsibly, and thoughtfully. Foraging has been given an unfairly bad reputation by many well-meaning but often ignorant conservation-minded people who claim that we're destroying the areas that we harvest. The reality is that most of us really care for and protect our foraging sites. Don't give them fuel for their fire by making a mess, leaving holes, or selfishly wiping out entire areas of roots, bulbs, or rare plants. Now here's places to avoid, because not everywhere is safe for foraging. As you go plant hunting, avoid harvesting from the following areas. Manicured public spaces. Along the sidewalk in town, in the strip of grass beside the post office, around the gazebo in the town square, or in the lawn at college, there are plenty of plants growing. These areas, however, are spaces I would strongly advise avoiding. Areas that are in full public view and yet aren't reserved as a wilderness or a natural area are almost certainly contaminated. Businesses really don't like the dandelion growing through the sidewalk, the chickweed sprawled out at the side of the building, or the clover in their lawn, and will usually employ whatever chemical means necessary to improve the look of their establishment. The only wild food that might be safe in these environments are tree nuts and fruits. Under power lines and around utilities. Power companies don't like plants growing around their lines and will often spray toxic pesticides directly under and around them to keep the spaces clear. Roadsides and parking lots. Cars generate and leak tons of chemicals onto the road, and this contaminates the areas directly bordering roads. The concentrations of lead along roadways built before the advent of unleaded gasoline can be surprisingly high. As such, avoid plants growing downslope of roads or directly bordering parking lots. Industrial areas and contaminated ground. An amazing feature of many plants is their ability to uptake toxins from the soil and clean it in ways that no human-powered crew could. This process is called bioremediation, and it's fascinating. It means, however, that many mineral-rich plants such as clover and wild spinach could easily be contaminated if they are growing in toxic ground. Industrial areas, dumping sites, and any other place potentially contaminated with chemicals are places to avoid. Make sure your teachers practice what they preach. Foraging has recently increased in popularity as the internet has made information on it more widely available. I have personally been very grateful for the information available in modern sources, as it set me off on this journey 10 years ago. And although I'm glad to see people discovering healthy food and being outdoors, I have become increasingly perplexed and disturbed by the inaccurate and just plain wrong information that has sprung up alongside all the good stuff. You can see everything from misidentified pictures, bad advice, and even recipes that just don't seem possible. 
Not everything online is true. Not even everything in a book is true. So how do you figure out what is? I would advise to only trust a resource if the writer has worked with and eaten the plant they're talking about. This may seem obvious, but you would be so surprised how many resources have sprung up online or in print that don't check that one simple requirement. Obviously, bad teaching could have bad consequences, so use these four guidelines to vet a potential new teacher. Make sure they have photos of the plant, and specifically photos they have taken themselves. Make sure they use the scientific name of the plant they are discussing. Many plants go by several different names, and sometimes different plants go by the same name. It's too easy to get identification crossed when you only use a local common name. Make sure the article or author teaches you what specific parts of the plant to use and what part of their growth to use them. Some plants are only edible or palatable at certain points of their growth, and not every part of every edible plant is safe. Use caution when writers talk about the plant in vague terms, sharing what they've heard or what this has been said. They should have plentiful first-hand information about a plant. And be sure to use that same caution when medicinal uses of a plant are shared. Often people don't have experience using them for healing and are just copying information that they've read elsewhere. That certainly doesn't mean that the information is bad, but you should only use it as a touchstone for further research, not as a trustworthy fact on its own. Now with all that said, I can vouch that the resources I've put in this video come from foragers who eat what they teach. I also promise that every plant I teach about will be one that I have gathered and eaten personally. Even so, don't take my word for it. You need to learn for yourselves and use non-fearful yet discriminating eyes on whatever you read. Now on that, I've included these helpful links in the description box below. After this video, be sure to check them out for tons of ways to continue growing and learning and foraging. If you check out our website on Insiting, we have an ever-growing list of articles on foraging there. You can also check out Forager Chef, Hunter Angler Gardener Cook, or Eat the Weeds for three great websites that continually give new information about foraging. As far as books go, I would be remiss if I do not mention Samuel Fair right here. His three books, Forager's Harvest, Nature's Garden, and Incredible Wild Edibles are by far the best foraging books I've ever read. But I'd also add to that list Midwest Foraging, for those who live in the Midwest, Botany in a Day by Thomas Elpel, and all the books by Ewell Gibbons, the granddaddy of modern foraging. Foraging is an endeavor you can begin in a weekend and then can continue refining for the rest of your entire life. Being able to interact with the wild on such a direct level transforms the landscape from an inert green expanse to a wild garden that you know and understand more and more each year. It can also cultivate a love for those spaces, the sort of love that makes foragers some of the most surprisingly involved and passionate conservationists and naturalists in the world. When you bring home a bowl full of free food that you didn't plant or cultivate, it can also seed an incredible gratitude in your heart as well. So maybe this summer, instead of tugging your child away, you could grab their hand and accompany them to those blackberry brambles and together enjoy some of the best food in the world.